I'm standing at perhaps one of the most important stones at Stonehenge. It is, in fact, stone number 11. An odd-looking stone for the outer sarsen stone circle, but I believe it's important for two reasons. One, to help explain the geometry of Stonehenge, and two, to also explain some new astronomical observations at Stonehenge. Stone number 11 is one of 30 sarsen stones that once stood in the outer sarsen stone circle at Stonehenge. The stone itself stood at the most southerly point of this sarsen circle. What is unusual or rather special about this stone is that it is a lot shorter and thinner than the other 29 sarsen stones. Here we can see that difference when we compare the size and shape of stone number 11 to its nearest neighbour, stone number 10. We can clearly see that number 11 is about a third shorter in height and almost half the width of stone number 10. And stone number 10 is just one typical stone standing within the sarsen circle. Certainly, the dimensions of stone number 11 do not match the dimensions of the other 29 sarsen stones. And why such an odd looking stone like this was chosen for the sarsen circle is a question seldom asked. However, as I said at the start of this film, I believe that it was chosen for two reasons. One, to help the builders use units of measurement that would help them build Stonehenge. And two, to capture some important astronomical alignments at Stonehenge. I'm now going to demonstrate with some experimental archaeology how the dimensions of this stone correspond proportionally to the measurements of the central stone settings at Stonehenge. To help me, I'll use two primitive tools. This one here with some antler bone attached to a length of rope, which matches the width of the stone, which would be used to help mark out on the ground the positions for other stones. The second tool I'll be using is two pieces of wood which are connected by a length of rope. The measurement taken from stone number 11. In this demonstration, I'm going to show how the stonemasons could have used the measuring rods to help determine the size of the trilithons of the stones themselves required. They can measure the width of the stones and also the depth of the stones. The measurement for the rope and wooden rods being taken from the width of stone number 11. In this demonstration we can see how the measuring rods have been used to help position the stones within the circle. Again, the measuring rods being taken from the width of stone number 11. Here we can see how the gaps between the stones could have been set out by using the same measuring rods. I said at the start of the video that stone number 11 was important for two reasons. The first reason was for the geometry of Stonehenge. The second reason is the astronomy of Stonehenge. It is no coincidence that stone number 11 is aligned exactly north-south at Stonehenge. There is a north-south alignment cutting right through the centre of Stonehenge. If I measure the orientation of this stone, it is due south, 180 degrees azimuth. I now need to explain some of the astronomy behind stone number 11. The sun, when it rises on the horizon, is level with the horizon at zero degrees altitude. Then throughout the day, the sun rises in altitude until it reaches a point at midday 
it reaches the highest points in the sky, and then it begins to descend. When the sun reaches the highest points in the sky, in terms of astronomy, it is known to transit the meridian. That is, it crosses an imaginary north-south line. So the sun reaches its zenith point, the highest point, at midday. Now in the winter, the sun positioned at midday is quite low in the sky. During the summer solstice, the altitude is quite high. So it is at the time of the winter solstice that a special event occurs at midday, when the sun is about 15.5 degrees altitude in the sky. So let me explain what two events occur. So it is at midday, on the day of the midwinter solstice, when the sun transits the meridian, it casts a shadow on stone number 11 that stretches all the way up through this gap. And the shadow stretches as far as this point into the centre at Stonehenge. And what also occurs at midday, on midwinter solstice, is that the sun cuts across this part of the trilithon, casting its light into the centre of the circle as well. So we have the light coming in and we have the shadow coming in, marking the midday at midwinter. So is there anything else that occurs at the time of the winter solstice? In fact there is, but I now need to go to the avenue to explain what happens next. One of the most spectacular astronomical observations you'll get the chance to see at Stonehenge takes place during the time of the winter solstice sunset. It is at this point that the sun actually sets as if it's setting within the centre of Stonehenge. And this illusion takes place at this specific point we're standing in the avenue. I believe that stone number 11 was used by the builders of Stonehenge as a measuring gauge. So much so that the builders could keep coming back to this stone in order to check the lengths of the ropes that they used when building Stonehenge. In this manner, they had the means of maintaining accuracy and control of the measurements required for both planning and building Stonehenge. But stone number 11 was not just used as a measuring gauge. Astronomical alignments are noted amongst the architecture of many other British prehistoric monuments. So Stonehenge is not really that much different from other monuments. However, monitoring midday at midwinter does indeed make Stonehenge special. More so when we consider the spectacular interplay between light and shadow that takes place at midday followed a couple of hours later by the illusion at midwinter sunset. And here are some images of that illusion. Perhaps we could be looking at midwinter's day as a special day of unique celebrations. Standing at the centre of Stonehenge, the ritual priests could monitor the interplay between shadow and light to such a degree that they would be able to establish precisely the day of midwinter. Certainly, they would then have had a couple of hours to sound their horns and call forth the masses of people to stand in the avenue and witness the dying sun descending into the centre of Stonehenge, marking the end of one year and the beginning of the next. Yeah.